So I think a year from now, we're going to have triple the users. We'll have Bitcoin at 300, 400,000 a coin. I'll just uh, people are pulled into it. You know, it's like a black hole, if you will. All value, you know, everything goes to zero against Bitcoin in terms of purchasing power. So that means not only fiat money, but stocks, bonds, commercial real estate, fine art, gold. Gold mm -hmm. gets demonetized. I mean, yes. Trump did mention gold. And so Bitcoin is a ladder to the future. You know, the, the, the block, the uh, height, the block mm -hmm. height is essentially this ladder that's going into the Bitcoin singularity mm -hmm. into the future and, uh, you know, redefining time, energy. And so as a species, we have that singularity. In a sea of non-playable characters. That's for damn sure. So thank you so much, Max. Don't let Here your kids is. touch the sh**. <laughs> okay, this is a venereal disease that came out of Jay Powell's asshole. It's fucking dangerous, it toxic shit. Go after the finance guy. Don't let the anybody rails, folks. anywhere near this shit. It's terrible. Mr. Max Kaiser, a true playable character in a sea of non-playable characters, a, a, someone that can actually critically think in a sea of people who cannot think. How are you, sir? That's quite an introduction. Yes. Thank you. Yes. I feel elevated by it. I'm going to bring my A game to this interview. I'm not just going to say the same. Well, we got old a dollar. Shit. You can start over off. and over again. Well, exactly. I'm going to stretch the stretch audience's your mind. mind. Stretch, stretch your mag imagination. Something new. Something fresh. Well, first off, let's start with Donald Trump. What about? You saw the speech today. Yes. What did you think? Well, so you had uh, some speeches at the event. You had Trump, you had RFK, and uh, you had a few others. So I think what was surprising, I guess, is that RFK's speech was a, had a lot more detail and a lot more kind of depth into it in terms of Bitcoin. Yeah. I think he's been orange-pilled harder, if, if you catch my meaning there. And Donald Trump uh, came in, he you know got the executive summary and hit a few points. And it's good. It's great, you know, because he is Donald Trump, and there's going to be a lot of impact on and it. You know, you can't ask for more. Uh, but if you're just saying, you know, analyzing it, let's say word for word, note for note, I'd have to say RFK, you know, seems to get it uh, more. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I would say underwhelming. Trump's speech was under very underwhelming, and I I expected more. To be totally honest, and I, from as much as you can expect from a politician, I expected a lot more. So I, I think you nailed it. That's exactly I know a lot of people here, too. I just talked to a lot of people. So um, what do you think it means? I guess the, the trump Kelly relationship going forward, I, I, presuming that Trump does win, which is not a guarantee. But w what do you see going forward? Obviously, it's been a lot the last week or so. You've uh, you've made a lot of noise. Kelly himself, Trump. Where do you see things going, though, truly, at the end of the day, when, if he does win, that relationship between those two countries? The relationship between Trump and El Salvador and President Trump is excellent and it was during his first term and I'm sure it'll be excellent during his second term. The, the past week there was some tension in the air and a bit of controversy for a couple of different reasons. I think that when President was speaking he went off the cuff and kind of went on a sidebar and spoke extemporaneously about the situation at the border. Just in the past few days a uh, Salvadoran national attacked somebody in the U.S. and so this, you know, triggered that kind of sentiment in his mind. And you know, he gets away with saying lots of stuff and not getting a lot of pushback. Mm -hmm. But um, in this case, I felt immediately that this would be an opportunity to actually push back a little. And then he doubled down and said something else, and people were like, "Hey, you know, Max, you were right. You know, this is not." Uh, correct to be making these statements because they're materially wrong. They're factually incorrect. And he was suggesting that El Salvador is dumping violent criminals into the U.S. That's absolutely incorrect. They're dumping their criminals into the United States of America and we're not going to take it anymore. The truth is that during the Clinton administration, they were dumping gang members from Los Angeles, MS-13, into El Salvador. And that became the gang problem in El Salvador. It was exported to El Salvador from the United States. And that story, I think, needs to be refreshed, that people understand that's the true story, and that the remarkable progress that's been made by President Bukele is even that much more remarkable. Number two, 
to give you more context, there was CPAC, and both President Bukele and Trump spoke at CPAC, mm -hmm. and everyone was talking about President Bukele. He was the star of CPAC. And, you know, Donald Trump, I think, feels a little jealous mm -hmm. that the president, President Bukele, is really the most popular leader in the free world. He's young, he's very smart, he's dynamic, he's done absolutely fantastic things in the country. So there's a bit of a rivalry there. But I think, you know, the new administration will, there won't be any problems. I know that Don Jr. has been to El Salvador and met with the president. Uh, you have Matt Gates has been there more than once. He's actually buying property there. There's uh, now an El Salvador caucus in Washington, D.C., which will be very active. And, and so I think this, this whole past week will be forgotten. I kind of amplified it a bit just because I thought that it would cause a little drama, which uh, why not? Right. You know, um, I'm, that's kind of what I'm good at anyway, you know, like stir the pot a little bit and uh, without getting thrown out or arrested, you know, that's always the challenge for me is to stay out of jail uh, or, you know, so. I think that all went okay. So you were someone that I originally started studying 15 years ago, and so I've seen a lot of the rants and, you know, like you said, things that you're good at. However, there is an element to what you do, the truth, and what most people aren't willing to do is truly, like that's where I was going with standing up, picking up their, your cross, yep. and laying down your life. Most people are not willing to do that at all. Most people want to save their life, and they will shun their values, shun their principles, shun those things in order to live another day, whatever it is. You have put your neck on the line over and over and over and over again. HSBC, there's nothing there except a lie. It's traded on the FTSE as a lie. If you want to buy invest in a lie, buy it. Buy it. It's a lie. 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 There's nothing there. It's a piece of dirt. You buy that stock, you're buying financial terrorism. Don't you understand that? Keep valuing your children and all. Or do you want to see them sent to a concentration camp? Wait, oh. I forgot. Dancing with the Stars is on. Never mind. What, it, what is it in you that makes you do that or feel compelled to do that or just, just again your personality things that happened to you growing up that's always fascinating me about you how you most people will not do that and that's that in, that's that's a fact but you are for so I, I long think, why i think i think it boils down to one word authenticity so for my whole life even when i was a teenager and growing up i often like really sought authenticity and I'll give you an example an early example so when I was growing up in Westchester County New York I used to listen to a radio station called WRVR out of New York City is a jazz station and on that station I heard for the first time Gil Scott Heron who is a, a spoken word poet at the time you know predecessor to rap there was Gil Scott Heron you know and if, if the last poets and um, I listened to his song uh, my sister Nell got bit by a rat in Whitey's on the moon. And I'm like a teenager in my mm -hmm. suburban bedroom affluent community. And I'm like, that, like, what the fuck is that? And when I moved to New York a couple years later to go to NYU, you know, I moved to Harlem. I moved to 145th Street to mm -hmm. find Gil Scott Heron because I understood he lived in Harlem. And I lived in Harlem for four years. And it was, you know, uptown in the Sugar Hill area in the fucking ghetto. And I learned about authenticity in the ghetto. Like, if you can't be authentic, mm. they, you, get, yeah. you get sussed out, yeah. and that's dangerous. Yes. Like, the way to wow. put a shield around you to protect you is to be authentic. And that means you have to, if you're a freak, you have to be your authentic, freaky self. You can't hide behind any masks at all. And um, that's, that is a lesson I really sought to learn, you know, that I couldn't learn in, in any other way, you know, and, and being young, I felt like I just wasn't really, you know, had much to lose, you know, I was very interested in all of this culture, and I had heard about Harlem, you know, the, my whole life, and I was very interested in music and jazz and things, and um, then one day on television was Ronald Reagan, and Ronald Reagan was giving a speech which was, it's morning in America again. It's morning again in America. Today, more men and women will go to work than ever before in our country's history. With interest rates at about half the record highs of 1980. 
Nearly 2,000 families today will buy new homes, more than at any time in the past four years. And at that time, I'd been living uptown for four years, and I had basically gone feral. Like, I was like a street guy. I mean, I was going to NYU, but I was just a party animal, mm -hmm. really, for 24-7, uptown, downtown, anywhere. You know, it's just like in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. And um, it was really um, a great time to, uh, you know, punk rock was starting at CBGB's downtown. And uh, I was a DJ at WNYU, at the college radio station. So we were friendly with all the acts and all the clubs and all the bands. And we hung out with all the bands and we'd hang out at all the uh, jazz clubs uptown. And so, but I heard this Ronald Reagan speech, but I mean, I had run myself down to, to a degree. Like I, 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 I wasted my entire college career because I, I just was like always out running around and partying and listening to bands and stuff. And I felt like, oh, I'm going to be graduating soon. And I really have completely wasted my entire career in college and I'm doomed. And so I heard this speech by Ronald Reagan. He's on TV saying there's morning in America again. So um, as, as it so happened to be the case, one of my part time jobs during that era to keep myself going, you know, my rent was one hundred and forty dollars in on 145th Street and Broadway. And, um, you know, you could live in New York City for twenty dollars a day. I could pay rent. I could eat, you know, pizza is a dollar slice. Falafel is a dollar slice. Uh, a, a tray bag of good weed, you know, three bucks will last you several days, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you could just live uh, and have a fabulous time. And, um, I, but one of the part-time part jobs that I had, I, I ended up working, uh, just picking up a job on a Wall Street brokerage firm with a broker doing what's called cold calling, the same job mm -hmm. that Peter Schiff he started his right, career yeah, doing, yeah. just dialing, dialing, dialing. And when I walked into this office at Payne Weber on 140 Broadway, which is just two blocks from Wall Street, I just fell in love with everything there. And it was a complete different, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's totally the different. authentic, yeah. this authentic meme you know, struck me like, I felt like a, a, a certain familiarity with it, I guess because I was basically a snot from the suburbs anyway. So it's like, wow, these people, I really like the suits and the ties here and everyone's making all this money. So this is 1983 and suddenly this bull market on Wall Street started. So um, uh, the guy who I was working for, you know, he said, well, you know, I can, we can get you set up with a license in three or four months. You know, you can mm -hmm. get on the phone and be a stockbroker. Yeah. So, um, that's exactly what I did. So I stayed on Wall Street for eight years, from 82 to 1990, and I made a fuck ton of money. And all the bad habits I had up until that time that I started on Wall Street became worse because now I added money. So then in 1990, another big change, kind of on the theme of authenticity and we're kind of trying to, trying to just throw yourself into situations that are foreign to you, but finding something within yourself that's authentic that allows you to survive and maybe even thrive. So in 1990, I went to Paris uh, to see a friend, to go to a party. And I arrived in Paris in 1990 and I fell in love with Paris. I felt like I had been lied to my whole life that this beautiful city existed and I didn't really know about it. The way that it struck me as being so beautiful and so spectacular. So I, within, I ended up two weeks, became two months. And then I said, fuck it. I called in my resignation. I sold my, my business. And I stayed in Paris for five years doing, doing nothing because I, I had saved up a bunch of money and I wasn't needing to work. So I just um, lived uh, in, in Paris and in France and in Europe and, and just met people. And again, tried, tried to be my authentic self. And that was all I had to go with because I didn't know French, I didn't know anybody. But if you allow your true character to be seen, you know, people gravitate to that. You know, if you are constantly behind a mask, mask. or you're trying to please somebody, or you're trying to fill, fill someone else's expectation, is really, you'll never experience that kind of direct one-on-one -on -one relationship with, with people, you know, right? And that is generally the greatest thing anyone can experience is having 
a relationship with other people. You know, people and humans are a very advanced species here on planet Earth, and they're very interesting. But in order to communicate with them, you really have to get rid of all the artifice and try to find, and it was easier, you know, in the long time ago. You know, the modern technology has obfuscated our souls. So uh, I lived there for five years. Then I get a call one day from my friend from NYU, who I hadn't talked to in years, Alec Baldwin, who was an actor, famous actor at that point. He had married Kim Basinger. He said, oh, my wife Kim's coming to Paris to do a movie called pret a Porte for Robert Altman, and I want to come see you and hang out. So he showed up, and he was there for six, seven weeks, and we were just hanging out all day. I showed him a treatment for a film I had written just, you know, on one of my unbusy days at the cafe. And he's like, wow, this would be a great vehicle for me and my brother Billy. So he called up Harvey Weinstein at Miramax, and by the next day they had bought this uh, treatment for a script idea for a lot of money. And Alec was like, oh, I got to go. I'm going back to Hollywood. We're going we're gonna to make this movie. And, you know, if you want to come to L.A. and be a producer. So I went back to where I was living and I'm like, oh, well, you know what, that might be interesting. So I went to L.A., didn't know anybody except Alec. And, you know, I once again relied on just being myself to see how that would go. And um, they did not make that movie because as what the case, I mean, many times in Los Angeles, movies going to turn around after a certain period of time where the studios will uh, put them up for sale to anybody who wants to buy the project for the amount of money they have invested in the project. You know, Miramax would do this all the time. You know, they're trying to create lots and lots of projects. But I did hook up with another friend of mine who I knew from Wall Street, Michael Burns, who was running over there at uh, Prudential Securities. And I said, you know, Michael, I've been here two weeks in Los Angeles, and it's the most boring town I've ever been in. Everyone, oh, I mean, I look at Variety Magazine, and I see all these movies, and I see the box office number, and it's worth X number of billions of dollars. And I'm like, so there's a box office futures contract for studios to hedge their exposure, right? He's like, no. I'm like, really? Why don't we create one? So we started to make a box office futures contract, and then at that time something came along called the internet. This was in the mid 90s. So I said, why don't we create a virtual stock market and trade virtual movies and virtual stars? And this became the Hollywood Stock Exchange, which I started in 1996. I created the technology called the Virtual Specialist Technology. It's patented, 5950176 is the patent number. And we launched it, it became very popular, very successful, got a million users. And then um, in 2000, 2001, you had a dot-com crash. We sold it to Cantor Fitzgerald. Mm -hmm. Cantor Fitzgerald moved the entire operation to the top floor of the World Trade Center three weeks before 9-11. It then went, it got 9-11. Uh, I had already banked my, you know, my check, and I had gone back to France. And I was living in the south of France. And um, I was in the south of France for two years, and then I walked into a cafe, and the owner said, Max, meet Stacy. I met Stacy for the first time. She turned around, I looked at her, and I'm like, wow, this is the woman that I've been looking for for 20 years, really. This is the, yeah. this, I know I'm gonna be marrying this woman. I knew it right away. And then I've been with Stacy since 2003. And so this, then the story is more familiar to people who follow our content. We started yeah. doing Al Jazeera English, and we did, I did a show on Press TV for four years called On the Edge with Max Kaiser. We did a BBC show called The Oracle with Max Kaiser. We did, of course, Kaiser Report on RT for 13 years. And uh, we do the Orange Pill podcast, but that's all been with Stacy. Stacy had been doing t TV and films in London um, at the BBC. She was similar to me in that we were both expats, expatriates, but she was in London, I was in Paris. So, you know, when you're an expat, you develop a, a certain uh, type of personality, if you will, uh, that we, we kind of meshed right away on that, on that, because you're always basically a foreigner, you know, in somebody else's land. And it's intriguing and it's kind of interesting. And, and uh, so we, that takes us pretty much up, up to the present. So to answer the question about taking chances or taking risks or putting myself out there, you know, you have to put yourself out there every day or you're not living, right? That's what life is. If you're hiding, you're not living. 
So you need to put yourself out there, your authentic self, whatever that may be. And Bitcoin, as I say, is the magic mirror that exposes you to yourself. If you are not really that great character, Bitcoin will make you worse. And if you're a good, basically a good character, Bitcoin will make you a better person. Like, and Andreas Antonopoulos was a guy who was already a very soulful guy who had other people's interests at heart. And he became a great educator and was a great guy for an orange pill, many people. Uh, Michael Saylor, similarly, Bitcoin took a very uh, successful businessman and made him really a, an educator and a leader. And, and he's become a phenomenal success. You know, that's a Bitcoin is boosted what was already there. If you're Craig Wright, you know, you already cracked to begin with mm -hmm. and you're now going to prison. You know, if you're a, a Do Kwan, you know, you're already a crook from the moment you came out of your mother's womb. Now you're going to prison, right? So it just, it reflects who you are. It accelerates who you are. And this is the thing about Bitcoin we all, we all need to understand is that the day of reckoning is coming and you need to be right with Satoshi. Otherwise, you're going to get crushed by Satoshi. Okay, Donald Trump was making a speech about America and the contrast to RFK is that RFK said, we're going to put Bitcoin on our balance sheet. That's great because that's what you need to do in World War Bitcoin. If you don't have Bitcoin, you're going to get beaten by Bitcoin. Just like when gunpowder came around, if you didn't have gunpowder, you were taken over by the, those forces that did have gunpowder. And this is what I think is underestimated by most people, is the importance of Bitcoin in this current environment where fiat money is going to be evaporated completely and go to nothing. Gold being demonetized. Society is crumbling. The nation state model is crumbling. The central banks are crumbling. And Bitcoin is your ticket to sanity. Um, I'll finish with one last thing, which is that I started tweeting recently about my journey in Alcoholics Anonymous. So in 1998, um, uh, no, 1988, 1988, I started in AA, so I'm celebrating 36 years. Uh, the 30th of July, as a matter of fact, so coming up in three days, it'll be 36 years. So in AA, you know, you come be with, with, with an alcohol addiction, and, but to stay sober is a spiritual journey. And similarly with Bitcoin, you know, you come for number go up, but it's really, ten it, it becomes a spiritual journey in my opinion, the way I see it, and I've seen yeah. it now, seen longer it than most, yeah. right? And I've seen a lot of things come and go, and I've experienced many things in the Bitcoin world, and I really see it overlapping the alcoholics, my journey in recovery in Alcoholics Anonymous as well. So again, getting back to authenticity, you know, sobriety allowed me to be more of my authentic self. Bitcoin does the same thing. I feel alive. And I can always feel more alive, you know? I mean, I'm talking to you, I'm talking to people out here. I like meeting people and hearing what they're up to because that energizes me, mm -hmm. you know, because nothing's more interesting than, than other human beings. That's my answer. Yeah, that's incredible. Uh, two more quick ones, and I know I wanna be cognizant of your time. Why, going back to kind of why I was saying this, again, you are, again, you're willing to give this, this, your background and why it is. And I, I think everyone's personality is different, right? Not everyone's made to stand on stage and, and speak truth. Have you been, are there times that you've been afraid to say what you're about to say? And you're like, I know there's a lot of powerful men with weapons that might not like what I'm about to say. Have there been times where you just said, this has to be said regardless? Have there been times where you've been afraid to say what you were about to say? If you were liking this interview with Max, you're going to love Max in some Bitcoin trading cards. This is our company that we run that's really all about Bitcoin education and adoption. This is where the real education begins with the young, with the old, people who aren't into Bitcoin, aren't into money, aren't into the news, whatever it might be. So go check this out. You'll get all kinds of concepts in here. You'll see Max in here in Series 1. This is Series 2. So go check that out now. We would love for you to be a part of this community of Orange Pilling the World, one collectible trading card pack at a time. Now back to the show. Yeah, a few times. I mean, if, the thing about talking about finance and banks is that there's no risk. I mean, you can say Jamie Dimon's a cunt and Jamie Dimon won't care because they can always print more money, <laughs> right? So, right. I mean, when you attack the banks and you attack the central banks, they do not care. But when I said on Al Jazeera that I declared a fatwa 
on Al Jazeera, I guess Hank Paulson, during the 2008 crisis, and said that his head should bounce down the Capitol stairs in Washington, D.C. Right? I said I was trying to trigger uh, Salman Rushdie on a U.S. official, mm -hmm. on Al Jazeera English. I mean, that was probably one of the dicier moments yeah. in my broadcasting <laughs> career. And um, the response was from Al Jazeera. They invited me back the next week and they said, we'll have you back to talk about stuff. Please don't issue any fatwas. You know, that was their, their, their request. Um, but when you're talking about the finance world, literally they don't care. The, the, the times that I have veered into other areas in energy mm. and defense or military yeah. spending, Okay. The, mo the journalists, the most journalist murders are environmental journalists covering the energy industry. They're, every year, many get murdered. And um, if I don't cover that area for that reason. It's too dangerous. It's too dangerous. Also, military, military contractors, I make, I, I, I make jokes about them, et cetera, but I don't, I would, I don't do an expose mm -hmm. like on yeah. Rockwell yeah. or Boeing. You know, like I would never go out there and say, an insider told me Boeing, uh, you know, uh, is selling faulty equipment or mm -hmm. something like that because they would fucking kill me. They kill people, yeah. right? That's so, yes. so it sounds like, oh, I'm saying stuff that is, you know, could potentially be trouble. But you know, if it's in finance, it, nobody cares. That's what I'm saying. I never felt ever at risk saying anything about people in the finance business, but in the oil or energy sector or the defense military contracting sector, it's definitely another story. Look at uh, Julian Assange. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, say, yeah. He posts a video of the U.S. industrial complex killing people from a helicopter, and he just went through this harsh ordeal. Uh, and, and he's now is free, thank, thank goodness. But, um, but that's not for me. So I mean, I have my, uh, I have my, 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 my guardrails mm -hmm. that I wouldn't, you know, I don't, I mean, on the finance side and on the Bitcoin side, I bring enough interest to it. And I think that's the solution for it. I think that's the answer to it. I think everyone benefits from it. So um, I'm happy to stay there, but you know, it's not, it's not, it's not like I, f I think I'm Teflon and that nothing can hurt me. Um, that's why I stay away from areas that I know yes. um, would be uh, dangerous for yes. me. Well, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. Re uh, really quickly on Bucky Fuller. I know you're a big, you're a student of Bucky Fuller. Um, well, I wouldn't say I'm a student of Bucky Fuller, but I have studied his work. Um, you know, I've read his books. And he's a guy who exemplifies this attitude that we're talking about, about authenticity. You know, he made the decision yep. in very early on in his career that he was only going to do things that would help humanity as a whole. So he went, he did the geodesic dome and he invented the electric car. And so he was selflessly pursuing science and engineering and architecture for the benefit of humanity. And he made that decision as a very young man. Yeah. And he stuck to that because that's who he was. And he stayed true to who he was. And he created the Buck, Buckminster Fuller, as we know him, and, and a fantastic legacy. And I think that's a good example. You know, philosophically, you know, we've heard since Socrates to know thyself, right? This is yes. actually one of the most difficult things anyone can undertake is self-knowledge, to go into one's self and to look critically at oneself. And and, uh, and and to accept oneself. I mean, part of the sobriety story is to acceptance is a big word you see in AA meetings and in, in sobriety. And a lot of it is accepting yourself. You know, accepting the you know the fact that you know you have made a mess of things. Mm -hmm. You know, initially when you begin. Yes. You know, and you need to at least acknowledge that to begin with that you have made this mess, you know, acknowledge this, you know, and, and, and to go from that, from that uh, starting point. But I'd say Buckminster Fuller is like that. You know, a lot of my favorite artists are musicians and, you know, I'm always, I always, um, I'm always looking for stuff that I think just pops because it's authentic, you know, um, and that energizes me because I'm, 
trained my, you know, I don't know if the word is trained myself, but I've opened myself up to, to having my preconceptions challenged all the time because they're always changing. You know, biases and preconceptions, ide ideologues, ideologies are very limiting. You know, the, in economics, we've been, we've had only a few schools of economics, you know, Keynesian, Austrian, you know, socialism, capitalism, right? So really, Bitcoin is a new chapter in economics. It's a new chapter in money. And for people who spent their whole life studying economics and money, are they willing to say everything they've learned up until that point is wrong? No, they're not willing to say that. Very few, yes. you know, maybe two or three, you know, for yes. me, because I've always been, I've been reluctant to get too um, monolithic in what I do mm -hmm. and stick with something for too long and become too rigid in my thinking. You know, Bitcoin comes around and I'm allowing it to, to like I said, you know, I wrote the phrase, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes yeah. you, right? right? So that came from a, a, a conference called um, Crypto Springs in Palm Springs, California. And this woman comes up to me and, the, you know, she just found out about Bitcoin and here's how she can make it better. And, you know, and like I've heard this now from many people over years, I'm like, look, you don't change Bitcoin. Bitcoin changes you, right? And it's just like, you know, that's it. You know, that, and I only mention that because a lot of people use that phrase and I get no accreditation. Like so much <laughs> of the intellectual property in this industry, oh, I man. never get credit for, I mean, Michael Saylor, I, half the shit he says, I said first, okay? The other half is from Trace Mayer, okay? And I stole Trace yeah. Mayer shit, okay? So it's Trace Mayer, Max, and then Michael Saylor. But, you know, he doesn't give accreditation? No, I don't know what's up with that. But anyway, it's all good uh, because we're on the same pilgrimage to same the now. Bitcoin singularity when we join with Satoshi. And uh, the whole concept of um, money is redefined in our global unconscious minds and violence is demonetized, absolutely. And then what's left when you remove violence is love. So we're having that spontaneous global Bitcoin hashing orgasm, as I call it, yeah. where we just fucking come hard. <laughs> Every, you know, eight billion people have a simultaneous orgasm. Imagine that. I mean, even the aliens would be like, fuck, I'm getting in on this shit. They're in. You know, they'd be flying in. Your sound man is falling asleep. Look at that. He's wandering. He's, He's like over there looking it's over been there. Long, it's been He's a like, long what the days. hell is this guy going on about? You told me days. I'd be in talking to Bitcoiners. This guy's a nutter. <laughs> last last question. I feel like we, that. by the way, that one thing is what you really, probably four or five years ago, a really orange building might have been my, my real inflection point after studying uh, you years of 15 years ago, Robert Kiyosaki, many people, but really understanding Bitcoin probably five years ago was the love part. So removing war. That was, that's probably one of the most impactful things, I believe, when you're talking to somebody about it. Um, and I feel like we also answered the question I was going to ask you, what keeps people in the matrix? However, I feel like we've kind of asked that. Um, you can touch on it if you want, but the last question, just game theory. It, it feels like between what, what happened, we saw here this week, obviously, in the last couple of months with the United States, obviously what you're doing in El Salvador, we see my Bhutan, right? We see all these different things going on. It feels like we're on that precipice of massive, massive adoption. I mean, what, what are, what are your, again, we're, we're trying to mind read 8 billion people and what's happening in the world. So I know I, I don't want to do that necessarily, but what do you think the next five years looks like, the next 10 years looks like when you kind of look out and say, holy cow, like we are on the map, we are on something massive. The president of the United States just came and talked about lines of code. And like you said, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. He was forced to come here. All these people are forced to come here, right? So what do you see? Is this just exponentially speeding up? It seems that way. What are, what are your thoughts? Well, the, the key word there is exponential, right? Um, the network effect mm -hmm. and the doubling effect that happens yeah. every year or every however many months, like Moore's Law yeah. or something, you know, Bitcoin's doubling effect, the network effect, and we saw it with the internet. So the internet in the 90s was bouncing around and we got to like 300 million users and then around 1997, I believe, Netscape went public. Mm -hmm. and, and that was um, the moment that suddenly went up to a billion, two billion users. Okay, it, the, the network effect doubled, you know, and doubled again. So you went 300 million, 600 million, 1.2 billion. Boom, boom, boom. 
you know, four million, five million. So that's that's I think we're at that Netscape moment in twenty twenty four. Feels like so I think a year from now we're gonna have triple the users. We'll have Bitcoin at three hundred, four hundred thousand a coin. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll have uh, I'll just uh, people are are it, it pulled into it. You know, it's like a black hole, if mm-hmm. you will. All value, you know, everything goes to zero against Bitcoin in terms of purchasing power. Yeah. So that means not only fiat money, but stocks, bonds, commercial real estate, fine art. Gold, mm-hmm. gold gets demonetized. I mean, yes. Trump did mention gold, um, you silver. know, and silver. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that that's a target that you're going for. And the number go up component of Bitcoin is very compelling because people are inherently, you know, greedy might be too strong a word, but um, it's a, I think it's like I've said before, Bitcoin is sent by God for humans to unfuck their money, you know, so the greed portion of our character as human beings is a little over tweaked, you know, it, 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 it served a purpose, maybe mm-hmm. more, it was more more uh, utilitarian in our previous mm-hmm. hunter-gatherer yeah. Hunter, existence, yeah. Yeah. you know, but when you can print money and then buy institutions and buy media and things, okay, now you're, you've, if you see what's happened to the culture and society, it's yeah. become extremely decadent and it's collapsing in many ways. So, you know, God is like, uh-oh, I, I added too much greed in that planet there in universe 12B stroke nine <laughs> in the multiverse of God. It's like, huh, I'm gonna come up with a patch you know, he sent his, I said, didn't I send my son down here? What the fuck? What happened to that? Well, you did what? You fucking crucified him. What are you fucking morons? He's just, he's just trying to tell you about love. Oh, man. So then he's like, oh, man, maybe I should just let these assholes die. Well, I don't know. Well, I'll give him one more shot. Send him Bitcoin. <laughs> are you sure, boss? Yeah, yeah, we'll give him another shot. Send him down some Bitcoin. Yeah, some cypherpunks. Uh, we'll see what happens. Oh, there's my friend. How are you? Good to see you. Good. So he sends down the Bitcoin, and that's where we're at now. And hopefully we it, the patch works. You know, he met, we, we hit the Bitcoin singularity, and there's Satoshi waiting for us because, you know, Bitcoin comes from the future. That's why no one knows the author of the white paper is because it came from the future. We'll discover the author in the future because the author lives in the future. I mean, it, why don't we know who authored the white paper? I mean, I don't know. Nobody knows uh, who authored the actual white paper. I mean, it's a, it's a handwriting sample. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Almost any handwriting sample in the world or written word sample, you can do a search and mm-hmm. find out where it comes from, right? Well, how did this one elude so many people? There's a few clues in terms of time zone and some right. phrases that are used and you kind of end up maybe geographically here. Yeah. And, but it's incredible to me that we do not actually know the actual author of the white paper. The only thing we do know for sure that it's not Craig White, right? Yeah. That's the only thing we know guaranteed yeah. for sure. But so, and my conclusion is that it, it's because it was written in the future. And so Bitcoin is a ladder to the future. You know the, the, the block, the, uh, the height, the block mm-hmm. height is essentially this ladder that's going into the Bitcoin singularity into the future and, uh, you know, redefining time, energy. And so as a species, we have that singularity and that's where that's where we're headed. You know, this reunion with ourselves. We get to know who we are in the end. That's the end of the story is you are who you are. That's the end. So all the gurus and the mystics already tell you that. You say, you are who you are. That's the secret of life. Authenticity. Right? It's authenticity. There you go. Okay? So that's why I'm Max Kaiser, the ratings riser. And uh, (laughs) wherever I go, ratings go higher. Um, I simply exude um, content 24-7. And, um, you know, every single one of these that's ever been printed throughout history goes to zero. Now, Bitcoin only means that um, it's gonna go there faster and permanently. 
There will never be, anybody will never attempt to do this again, uh, create this paper Ponzi scheme ever again, once we go into the Bitcoin standard. Okay? Done. And, you know? It's beautiful. That's it. Thank you so much, Max. Max Thank Kaiser. You. Yep. A, a true playable character. In a sea of non-playable characters. That's for damn sure. So thank you so much, Max. Don't let Here your kids touch this shit. <laughs> okay, this is a venereal disease that came out of Jay Powell's asshole. It's fucking dangerous, toxic shit. Going after the finance guy. Don't gotta, you let the guardrails, anybody folks. anywhere near this shit. It's terrible. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Max. If you like the interview you just watched with Max Kaiser, you are absolutely going to love the interview that we just did with Jeff Booth. Go check that out here. Or you're going to love possibly the Larry Lapard interview that we just posted here. Go check it out. Come on. We'll see you in there.